Hello, and welcome to Worship in the Gap for First Congregational Church in Port Washington, Wisconsin. I am not Reverend Jim McKenzie, as most of you probably know. I am Reverend Don Niederfrank, a member of the congregation. Jim had foot surgery this past week, and he is taking the week off to recover from that, and I think a well-deserved week off. Doing ministry in this uh, new time, doing it remotely and trying to find ways to connect and and to minister to uh, persons uh, without the availability of real-time presence is more difficult than expected, than one might assume. So Jim is resting his foot and I hope resting his soul. Jim's been a great interim ministry for our congregation and, and he deserves a week, of, a week of recuperation. I want to begin with a question, as, as Jim often does. I want to ask, how are you doing? Not how are you doing as individuals, how are you coping with the restrictions and uh, the uh, limits of this time of living in an, in an age of, of a virus, but how are you doing with each other? Being together 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can be a strain uh, for couples, uh, for friends, for siblings, uh, for parents and children, and so on. So that's what I would like to talk about. How to get along, how to survive times of conflict. The scripture passage I want to address is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters of the book of Matthew. Jesus was not a marriage and family counselor, but he did have concerns about persons being in conflict, persons not getting along with one another, a persons unable to get along with one another, at odds with one another. 
and he, he expressed his uh, concerns in that Sermon on the Mount from Matthew. I'll, I'll read the passage that is relevant. I think many of us know that the Sermon on the Mount is not a sermon. It is called the Sermon on the Mount because uh, Jesus sits down and gathers his disciples uh, around him and, and expands on a number of subjects. That's one of the reasons uh, scholars don't consider it to, to be a sermon. It covers a broad range of topics, of various topics, having to do with um, interpreting the law and uh, how to, uh, who is blessed and who is not blessed and, and so on. It's also not a sermon because Jesus is nowhere referred to as a, as a preacher. Uh, he is addressed as rabbi, um, as teacher, but he was mostly seen as simply a teacher and a healer. And when the rabbis spoke, they usually concerned themselves with one subject at a time. The Sermon on the Mount is a collection of Jesus' teachings that Matthew has uh, brought together in one place in his gospel. The passage I'd like to read is from the fifth chapter, uh, beginning with the 21st verse. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that a brother or a sister has something against you, go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, Jesus is being a, a bit hyperbolic here in talking about the consequences of being at odds with one's brothers or sisters, meaning uh, one's fellow citizens or member of the community. But he does want to make the point that being in conflict with another person is important. It's important enough to speak hyperbolically about the consequences. So what does Jesus tell us to do? Well, he doesn't. He, he, he just says it's very important and you need to do something about it. But he doesn't tell us what. So let me offer a little advice uh, as, a, as someone who has spent a uh, number of decades in parish ministry, but also a number of decades as a husband and father, and some years as a grandfather, not many. So what do we do when we are in conflict? Let me offer a couple of object lessons first. Here's one. It's a book. It's a good book. This happens to be uh, The Virginian by Owen Wister. Now, it, you need not have this particular book, but what I am going to suggest is when you are in conflict with someone, find a good book, open the book, read the book. Now, I know if you're mad, it's very difficult to read even a good book. It's, you find yourself going, 
looking at the page and going, I don't know why they're saying it, but why the bridge of free Gabriel she and and so on. Just open the page, look at the words, keep looking at the words, keep trying to breathe, stay there with the book until you get into the story and let that story just take you out of the present moment of conflict for a while. That doesn't work. I have another suggestion. Comfortable shoes. Not that they will change your mind or, or your feelings or your emotions just by putting them on. But take your comfortable shoes, put them on, go for a walk, get out the door. Okay, it's raining, put something on your head. Get away from the conflict. Go for a walk. Breathe deeply. Let your heart rate slow down, your blood pressure come down. Look around, see what's happening in the spring, then come back. Now let me offer some advice about staying and resolving in conflict. This is something I've told couples on their way to being married for a number of years. It's not untimely. It may be that it applies more often than we would like to admit. So let's take two persons who are in conflict. One of them is very angry. The other one has a job. This is your job if someone is angry at you. Shut up. <laughs> yes, St just stop. Just your job is to be quiet. When someone is angry, they need to express that anger and they will express that anger. And if you keep interrupting them, it will just take longer for them to express that anger. So in order to move through the conflict most easily and most quickly, just be quiet and listen. They want you to listen, first of all. Now, if you are the person who is angry, you have a job also. Your job is to talk about what the person did, not who the person is. I can understand, I can hear very easily. I can be quiet and listen to someone talk about what a foolish thing I did. But if someone wants to talk about what a fool I am, that's a little more difficult. The foolish thing I did, it's done. Uh, whatever it is, it's broken, it's, it's spilled, it's, the, the stupid word has been said. There's no argument there. But whether I am a fool or not, that's debatable. So if you are the angry one, speak about the deed, not the doer. Now, if you are the one who has done the deed and you have listened, your response may involve three things, but they should be genuine. You may need to take a walk before you come back and offer these three things. Here they are. A sincere apology. And don't say you are sorry just so the other person will stop being angry. Say you're sorry if you're really sorry. Offer to make amends. Did you eat the last of the ice cream? Offer to go to the store. Offer to put your mask on and go to the store and get some more ice cream. Or to fix what you broke. And the third thing. If you can, say that you will not do it again or at least say that you will try to not do it again. Now, what I've said applies to persons not getting along. 
if you are getting along during these months of, of isolation and staying so safe at home, bless you. I'm happy for you. I'm happy for me. If you're wondering, Susan and I are getting along just fine. And if you are living alone, these words apply to you. Because eventually we will come back together. We will gather again as family, as friends, as congregants, as, as neighbors. And we will at times have times of conflict. We will step upon one another's toes. We will rub each other the wrong way. We will really tick each other off sometimes. Then we will breathe and we will move on. Thank you. Would you pray with me in closing? God of our waking days and our worry-filled nights, protect us from our own shortcomings and foolishness and from one another's as well. Be with us in this time of being alone together. Help us to use the challenge of these months as an opportunity to listen more carefully, to see more clearly, to breathe more deeply, to love more fully. Amen. Beloved of God, be safe. Keep those around you safe. God bless you and God bless this widely scattered and weirdly gathered congregation. Amen.